Okay, if you remember last week in, uh, well, in fact, the last few weeks that we've been going through First Samuel, remember there was the whole issue with the, with the Ark of the Lord. Remember that um, it had gone. That I mean, they initially they'd lost it in battle. Remember they went out. It was like you know Phineas and, and and so forth. They 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 lost the battle. They got killed. The Ark got taken. The Philistines had it. But then, of course, the Philistines, what did the Ark of the Lord do? Did it bring them blessing? It was really good, and they enjoyed having it with them? No, they got, they got struck with, you know, plagues of some description, um, you know, plagues in their secret parts. It was, it was a curse, you know, it was causing death and destruction. And so what did the Philistines do? Well, they basically came out with an idea that they said, we're going to get rid of it. And so they, so they took a, a new cart, and they, they put the Ark on it, and they had some oxen, and basically they said, we'll, we'll send it off, and... It'll go back to Israel. Well, well if, it's, if God is the one who's, who's leading it, then that's what's going to happen. If the God of Israel is real, that's what'll happen. Whereas if it doesn't, if these, calves, if these cows just go back to where their calves are waiting to be fed, then we'll know, well, they don't, Israel doesn't really have a God. And so that's, that's basically what they were going to do. And, of course, we see that's what did happen. It, it took it back. You know, it didn't go back to their calves. It went to, back, to the, back to the nation of Israel. It went Specifically, it went to, um, to Beth Shemesh. But of course, although it went to Beth Shemesh, which was that was good for Israel, it wasn't really a positive experience for them. Because remember what happened? They they looked into the ark. They did stuff they shouldn't have done. Fifty thousand of them died. Fifty thousand people died. And of course, that reminds us that the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. God's got specific commands. He says this is what's supposed to happen. This is who's supposed to carry the ark. This is how it's supposed to be done. And so when we go against what God says to do, there'll be consequences for that. But anyway, let's jump in. We're in chapter number 7. Chapter number 7, look at verse number 1. It says, And the men of Kirjith Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So the men of Kirjith Jerem, they come, they, they, they bring, bring it to the house of Abinadab. Notice that his son Eleazar is sanctified in order to keep the ark. You know, in other words, he's sanctified, he's, he's purified, he's, he's made holy. We, we looked a little bit at that at, at last week. And, um, but because they treat the ark with respect, then, then they, they don't suffer the same consequences. They, they don't have the same, um, the same fate as the men of Beth Shemesh did. You know, we don't read about the people in Kyrgyz Jerem suffering from it at all. Okay, look down at verse number two. And it says, And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kyrgyz Jerem that, that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So here we see the ark, it stayed there for a long time. It wasn't obviously doing any bad things to them. It stayed there for 20 years. However, the people of Israel, and that's not, not the people in, in, um, in Kyrgyz Jerem, that's sort of people in Israel in general, that they're basically lamenting, or, or they're, they're, they're mourning, or they're, or they're weeping, and they're complaining after the Lord. Yeah. Just a note here, is complaining a good thing to do? Is complaining something we should be doing? Think it's something we should be doing? Have a look. Keep your finger in First Samuel, but look at Numbers chapter number, Numbers chapter number eleven. Numbers chapter number eleven. See what God thinks about complaining. Numbers chapter number eleven. Numbers chapter number eleven. And this is a great. This is a great scripture, especially for children to remember. Numbers chapter number eleven. They should spend time reading this. Numbers chapter <coughs> eleven, verse number one says, "And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord." So is God happy about complaining? He's not happy about complaining. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the outermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And so we see here, people are complaining, and they and God brings judgment because of it. Now it doesn't stop there. If we keep on reading, look at verse number 4. It says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? So they, 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 were, clump, they were complaining in verse number one, and they got, you know, bad things happened because of it. But now, in verse number four, you've got people here, and it says they, the, the children of Israel wept. They said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now notice, they're saying, hey, remember when we were back in Egypt? Do you remember the food we had then? You know, we had, look, we had fish. We had cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. Sound, sounds quite nice. But of course, they're not mentioning the fact, well, when we were back in Egypt, we were slaves. They used to beat us. We had to work all, all you know, 
horrendous hours. You know, how about how about the fact that they, they took the male children and, and, were, and wanted them to be put to death? Remember, the midwives had to had to be deceitful in order to. Wasn't there? There's a whole pile of bad things. But what they're doing here is they're looking at some good points about it used to be good. So they're finding something to complain about. And the fact is, that's really the case. When it comes to complaining, anyone could complain about stuff. We've all got things we could complain about. But we've all got thing, also got things we could be thankful for. And if you choose to look at the bad things, the things you could complain about, that's going to lead you down a bad path. But if instead, if you look at things you, to be thankful for, then that's going, to, that's going to lead you down a good path. Because we've also all got things to be thankful for. And that's what it really comes down to. You see, people who are miserable, people who complain, they don't actually, don't actually have worse lives than people who, who are not generally characterised by complaining. That's not the case. I remember reading about, well, in fact, if you notice, if you meet, meet people, think about people who've had maybe a real hard life. Think about someone like a, I don't know, think about like a child, like in a wheelchair, you know, a, a crippled child. Most people think that would be a bit of a sad thing, wouldn't it? It'd be a sad thing to be a, a child, can't walk or has some sort of, you know, some ailment and they're, and they're, they're disabled. But the thing is, when you see disabled children, what you notice about them is they're just as happy as any other children. There's not really any different. In fact, if any, they might even be happier. Mm. You know what I mean? Kids that have got everything that they want, you might find that they're actually less happy. Okay? And so it's not really the situation. But anyway, see what we see here. They were complaining. So initially, they, they, they're complaining. They got, you know, bad things happened to them. They're still complaining, saying, oh, we missed this and we missed this. And so... Um, but of course, what God had done, God had provided this manna. So instead of having the food in Egypt, God had provided the, the manna. And it says, and when, verse number 9, and when the Jew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled, and Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favour in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people on me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child into the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. So basically, they're complaining, saying, Give us this flesh. And Moses is like, well, Where am I going to get it from? Where am I going to get from? In fact, Moses actually starts to get down about it. If you look back in verse number 15, he says, And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favour in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. So Moses, it's like because he's been complained to so much, it's getting him down so much, he's saying, God, oh, God just kill me. I can't put up with it anymore. All, all the complaints that these people um, are bringing to me. But then, have a look down in, um, uh, look down in verse number... Um, where are this number? Oh, I'll, I'll, oh. yeah. So, so basically, they're complaining. They're, they're, they're wanting some. They're wanting some flesh. And so, so God actually says, "Look at verse number eighteen. He says, "Say down to the people, sanctify yourselves again tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh, for ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day." nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? So basically God says, Look, you're complaining, you want meat to eat? I'll give you meat. In fact, I'll give you so much that's going to come out your nose. Does that sound pleasant? It does. I've ever been sick and, and you know done what happens sometimes when you're sick and sometimes it's come out. It's, it's horrific, isn't it? It burns and it's yeah, it's terrible. Now look at verse number verse number thirty one. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp as it were two cubits high upon the face of this. It's just quails everywhere. Okay, and, and it's just like a, a, a bird. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, or before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hattabar, because there they buried the people that lusted. So they lusted for this meat. God gave them the meat. They had it before they even really enjoyed it. They got struck down again. You'd think they'd learn, don't complain. Don't complain. Of course, we know the Bible says, for what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. In other words, they complained, 
God, you know, brought bad things in, upon them. We should learn and not complain. Okay, and in fact, it actually says that in the New Testament. It says, if you just look at the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter number 2, Philippians chapter number 2, um, Philippians chapter number, in fact, Philippians chapter 2, it's a, it's a great chapter. It talks about Jesus, sort of, uh, at the start of the chapter. In verse, verse number 3, it says, um, Philippians 2, verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So know this, it's saying, it says, the, let the mind, let the mind be in us, which was in Jesus. Jesus, he wasn't proud, he was humble. He humbled himself even to death on the cross. And, and that's the thing, when someone's complaining, they're really saying, I don't have what I should have. The opposite of that is being thankful, to saying, I'm thankful for what I've got. Complaining is the opposite, saying, I should have something, I don't have it. You're really thinking about yourself. He says, look, don't have the attitude, have the attitude that Jesus had. You know, Jesus, his attitude, he came to seek and to save that was was lost. He came to, came to give his life a ransom for many. That's what he came, thinking about others, not about himself. And then it says, wherefore, verse 9, God hath, all, hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. So Jesus was humbled, but he will be exalted above all. But then it says in verse number 12, no, excuse me, down in uh, verse number 14, sorry. Verse number 14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So it's saying, look, because Jesus had this humble attitude, we should have this attitude and don't complain. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That means do it without complaining. Don't murmur. Don't dispute. Don't complain. And when you do that, it says, look, you'll be the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked. You'll shine as lights in the world. And of course, Jesus said that too. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But the opposite of that is when you complain, people aren't seeing your light. They're going, oh, yeah, that's not something I want anything to do with. Okay, so that we, it's, it's an important principle. Don't complain. But if you look back in, um, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter number 7, maybe... Maybe, there were, maybe one of the reasons why they were complaining was, of course, because they were, being, um, they were still being oppressed by the Philistines. Look at that, verse number 3. Verse number 3, it says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you, out of the hand of the Philistines. So because they're being still oppressed by the Philistines, maybe that's why, you know, um, they're complaining. But what Samuel tells them, he actually tells them that their problem is that you've, you've gone away from the Lord. You're serving, what, what's it says here? Strange gods and Ashtaroth. Well, were they supposed to be serving other gods? No. Okay, and so that's what the problem is. He says, look, if you're really returning to the Lord, then what you need to do is put these things away from you because, because it's displeasing to God. And that's why the Philistines are allowed to be, you know, that's why you're losing to them. That's why they're defeating you, because of what you're doing. And often we can find in our lives, and obviously, you know, we're not necessarily fighting physical battles like that, but a lot of the thing, times problems can happen in our lives because of what we're doing. We're doing stuff, we're bringing it, it's like we're our own worst enemies. I mean, keep your finger in First Samuel, but look at Judges. The book of Judges just sums this up so well. Judges, look at Judges chapter number 2. And it's just like a, it's like a repeating cycle that you see just happening over and over again in the book of Judges. Look at Judges chapter number 2, verse number 7. Judges chapter 2 and verse number 7. It says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres in the Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there rose, rose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. So what are they doing? They're serving false gods. 
And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Isn't that what we just read back there? Yep. Yeah, he says, look, put away the Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. So why couldn't they stand before their enemies? Because they'd left the Lord. They were serving these other gods. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, verse 16, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn ways. It's just like it happens again and again and again. Verse 20, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died that through them I may prove or test Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So he's saying, look, because they, this is what they did, God allowed these other nations to still be among them, to test them. And so the fact is God will do the same thing with us. He'll leave things in our life to test us, to see, are we going to be faithful to him or are we not? Okay, and, and you think, wouldn't it be great if God just removed all these things from our lives? But they're there as a test, as a test for us. And so we shouldn't follow the example of the Israelites where they left God and served these other things and everything's, you know, God's like low down on the list. I'll serve this, I'll serve this. I've got these, all these other things that are more important than God. Well, you know, when you do that, there's going to be bad things come into your life. Okay, and so it's important we, we learn from the example. Because, of course, when, when that does happen, then God does deliver us. God does deliver us. When we turn to him, he will deliver us. I mean, look if you would at, um, look at Psalm, Psalm 91. Look at Psalm 91. We've just started seeing this one reasonably recently. Psalm number 91 and verse number 3. Psalm number 91. <clears throat> Psalm 91 and verse number 3. It says, Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Look down at verse number 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honour him. But notice it says, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. So why is God going to deliver people? Because, because we love him. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So it's tied up, it's linked up with our obedience. Turn back, if you would, to um, 1 Samuel chapter number 7. 1 Samuel chapter number 7, verse number 4. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 4. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. So, because, of course, God, he requires to be the only one, doesn't he? He requires to be the only one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, when Jesus was tempted by the devil in, um, in Luke chapter number 4, in Luke chapter number 4, the, the devil came and tempted him, and Jesus answered him with, it is written, because he, he wanted to, remember he wanted him to worship him. In Luke chapter number 4, um, verse number 7, he says, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Satan was tempted. Jesus said, if you worship me, I'll give you all these things, all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It's clear, God's supposed to be the only one. Not, you know, along with Balaam or with Ashtaroth or with any other false gods. No, worship the Lord God and him only. Verse number 5, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpeh, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. So Samuel says, look, gather together, I'm going to pray for you. And in fact, Samuel elsewhere talks about that he wouldn't, you know, sin in ceasing to pray. It's important that 
you know, we should be praying for each other. Samuel prayed for these people. Even though they were doing wrong, he prayed for them. We should pray for each other. It's an important um, part of the church. We should be praying that, you know, we would be faithful to serve God. Praying that we would be pleasing to God in, in every good work. You know, there's, and there's many examples. In fact, we, I think we, we often have that one on the. Is it on the back of here? I think it is. Let's have a look here. And um, yeah, Colossians chapter one, Colossians chapter number one. Just on, on the prayer list, there it says, "For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding." This is what we should pray for each other, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Do you think that your knowledge of God is going to increase more? You're going to do more good works for God more if more of the church is praying for you? Definitely. Absolutely. And, that's what, and so Samuel says, look, yeah, I, I will pray for you unto the Lord. Look at verse number, um, verse number six. Verse number six. And they gathered together to Mizpeh and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpeh. And it's interesting, you say, well, why would they pour out water? Why would you pour out water? Because water is something you need. It's essential for life. You don't have water, you're going to die. And obviously, and sometimes they lived in places where, you know, water's hard to come by. And so if you take water and pour it out, it's like, that's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice is what they're doing. Okay? It's, it's, it's kind of like it's showing the sincerity of what they're doing, that they really mean it. When they're, they're not just praying, they really mean it because they, they, they're pouring out water as a sacrifice. And not only that, they're fasting. It says they fasted on that day. Once again, well, what's that? That's saying that you're, you're going without food. Going without food. So instead of you know, eating, which you know, man, the Bible says man shall live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of, of God. But you know, we still do need bread to live. You know, we still do need food in order to live. Um, but what they're doing is they're foregoing that. You know, foregoing eating. To show God that yeah, we really mean it. We're serious. We're pouring out water. We're fasting. Um, and also they confess their sins. It says, we have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. And that, that, that's, a, the, that's a great example for us to follow. A great example for us to follow is we should be confessing sins. One of the things we do, you say, what, do you, what should we do when we pray? Part of what we should do when we pray is confess our sins. Confess our sins to God. We can, we can see a great example of that in, um, in Daniel. Daniel gives us a great example of that. If you look at um, Daniel, you've got um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9, page 905. Look at Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 3. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 3 says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So notice Daniel's praying, but notice... He's fasting as well. He's praying and fasting with sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made my confession. Notice that. I made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keep in covenant, covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. So Daniel knew the reason why we got, because of course Daniel was a captive. Remember, he was, he was transported captive, wasn't he? He was you know, captive in Babylon. How, well, how did he end up there? Because Israel, they got transported away because of their sins. And that's, he says, that's why it happened, because of their trespasses, which they trespassed. That's why the enemies conquered them and took them, scattered them into all nations. He says, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. Notice, he, he understands why it is that they're in this predicament. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against them. So he understands, God is still merciful. God still has forgiveness. Neither, he says, verse number 10, have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. So this is the problem. It's disobedience. It's not walking in the way that God says. It says, um, 
Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he goes through, and all the way through, he's confessing the sins of himself. He's confessing the sins of his people. Say, look, this is, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. And then he looked out at verse number 18, and he pleads with God. He says in verse 18, O God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So he's pleading over and over, praying, Lord, please forgive. Please have mercy. But he's confessing, we've done wrong. That's why we're in this situation. That's why... We've been carried away captive. Maybe it was stuff that we've done. Maybe it's stuff that our fathers have done. Okay? Because that, I mean, that, that's true as well. He, he confessed the sins of the whole nation. They'd been doing things that were wrong. And that's what we see here back in um, 1 Samuel chapter number 7. It says, we have sinned against the Lord. Uh, where are we? 1 Samuel 7, verse, verse number 7. It says, and when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpeh, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So what the Philistines do, that they've heard the Israelites, they've gathered together. So what are the Philistines going to do? They, they want to stamp out. They don't want any rebellion. So they're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to stamp this out. And of course, the Israelites, they're afraid. But should they really be afraid of the Philistines? Should they really be afraid of the Philistines? Is fear something that God's people should be, you know, we should be fearful? Well, the Bible does say that we should fear God. We should fear God. But the Bible also says that we shouldn't be fearing men. Look if you were at Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 28. This is Jesus speaking. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 28, page 971. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 28. He says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he says, Don't fear those which all they can do is kill the body. So don't fear men, but fear God. Verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So God's got everything in hand. He even knows the number of hairs on, your, on our heads. And then he says in verse 31, Fear ye not therefore, ye of more value than many sparrows. He says, don't fear, don't fear people, but do fear God, but don't fear people. Okay, And so um, that's, they, they, although the Philistines were gathering against them, they shouldn't have been afraid. They shouldn't have been, they should, you know, God is who they should fear. Look back at 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 8. Verse number 8. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people ask Samuel to pray for them. Now, the reality is, they should really have been praying themselves. They should really have been praying themselves. Now, it's okay to ask Samuel to pray as well. This is like, I mean, if you guys ask me, to, you, you know, have, uh, can you pray about this? And yeah, we do. I pray for it. You know, my family will pray for it. But we should all be praying. We should all be praying. Okay? And so, you know, sometimes people can, they just act like helpless. So, well, I can't do it. Can you do this for me? When the fact is, you know, we can do it. You know? I mean, the Bible says, you know, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. No, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We need to realize that there are things that we can do. Understand, we, part of what we can do, we can pray. We can pray. Not just think, oh, I need, I need this person to pray for me. Hey, it's great to have, you know, to pray for people, but it's also great to pray for what our needs are, our own individual needs are. Look at, um, look at verse number 9. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. So Samuel offers a lamb for a burnt offering. God hears his request. Now, of course, this pictures how God will hear our prayers. And one of the reasons why God hears our prayers is because of the sacrifice of Jesus. That's one of the reasons. He offers the, suff the sucking lamb. And obviously, I mean, we know Jesus... You know, John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In fact, if you look at Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter number 10, it describes and says how Jesus was sacrificed one time. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at verse number 1. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 1. 
says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. He's saying, when they sacrificed things in the Old Testament, that didn't actually make the person perfect. That, that didn't. Look at verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there's a remembrance made again of sins every year. So they've got to do it over and over again. For it is not possible, verse number 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So an animal sacrifice, that's not going to take away anyone's sins. It never has. It never has. That was something God prescribed they had to do. But it never, ever took away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me, to do thy will, O God. This is saying, Jesus, he's the one who came. He comes in the volume of the book. And of course, he ultimately is the one who did God's will. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Notice it says, once for all. Jesus was sacrificed once for all. For every priest standeth daily ministering, and often, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Remember? Those animal sacrifices, they never took away sins. But this man, after he had offered, <coughs> excuse me, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So notice, and then verse number, verse, number, um, verse number 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So notice, when Jesus was sacrificed, it was once. It was something that only happened once. That's why it's so foolish what they do in the Catholic Church. They have the, the Catholic Mass, and, they, and what they're doing, it's, you know, it's like they, they, they have the, the, the wine and, and, and the bread, and it's supposed to be the sacrifice of Jesus, and they do it again and again and again. That's what they say. That's what's supposed to happen. Jesus is being sacrificed again and again. But the Bible says, no, it was once. Once for all time. It only happened one time, not to be repeated. You know? and, and in fact, by that offering, it says, um, he opened, uh, look down at verse number, Oh, verse number 18. Oh, well, no, actually keep reading. Um, verse, number, verse number 15. It's 17, sorry. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So when Jesus was sacrificed, notice what happened. He made a new and living way through the veil. And of course, um, oh, actually, you turn and have a look. Look at Mark chapter number 15. In the, in the end of the Gospels, you can see, when Jesus died on the cross, one of the things that happened was that the temple, the veil of the temple, was rent. It was torn. Look at um, Mark chapter number 15 and verse number 37. Mark chapter 15 and verse number 37. Mark chapter 15, verse number 37. It says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. So he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. It means he died. And then it says, and the verse 38, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and he gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the son of God. So notice, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Now, now, this wasn't just like some little curtain. This was massively, no one could tear this. But, and also it got rent from the top to the bottom. From the top to the bottom. Why? Because it was just signifying, it was signifying that the way had been parted by Jesus. He, 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 you know, that's why the Bible says that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is that mediator and he opened the way. He opened the way. And so that's why back in 1 Samuel chapter number 7, when he took the sucking lamb and offered it a burnt offering, that's picturing Jesus. Okay? That's picturing Jesus in that he's opening the way. And then Samuel cries, he prays unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 10. Verse number 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, 
The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. So he's busy doing this offering. The Philistines come, they're going to fight against them. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. So the Philistines, they draw near to battle again, but this time God fights on behalf of Israel. He fights on behalf of Israel. It says in um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 3, verse 22 says, You shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. The Lord shall fight for you. In fact, if you look back at, um, we, we saw Psalm 91 before, look back at Psalm 91 again. Psalm 91, this time look down at verse number 5. Psalm 91 and verse number 5. Psalm 91 and verse number 5, it says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by day, sorry, for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday, a thousand shall fall at thy side. That's talking about being in battle. A thousand people are going to fall on this side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So saying God, he's going to protect us. He says, look, God's going to fight for us. And that's exactly what we see back in 1 Samuel chapter number 7. He says, look, they were, and God was the one. The Lord thundered with a great thunder that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them. And they were smitten before Israel. Look at verse number 11. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under, under Bethkar. And so that's basically what's happened is God, initially, he was the one that thundered against them. He discomforted them, but then the Philistines take off, and then the Israelites kind of pursue after them and, and smite them. It kind of reminds me, it's a bit like, um, reminds me of our cat. He's a bit like that. He, he often, he'll get in, well, I, don't if, I don't know if you described it as a fight. You, you hear this wailing. He's, he's basically, he basically cries for help. If some other cat comes near him, he just cries and wails, and you, and you say, oh, what is it? So you go outside and you open the door, and then, of course, the other cat that's attacking him, you know, takes off. And then it's like, oh, great, I've got reinforcements. And so he then takes off after them. Why? Because, you know, we've done the hard bit by chasing them away. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's all good. That sort of seems what the Israelites were like. Hey, God did the hard bit, and then they followed after them and, and smote them. Um, verse number 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpi and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So Samuel, he places the stone... As a, basically, it's like a memorial of God helping them. God helped them, and so they put the stone there, so that was going to remind them, this is what happened, this is when God, you know, to signify that fact. Um, you might remember a few weeks ago on a Sunday, we saw Joshua, remember Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan River? Remember the Jordan River? Remember, obviously, Moses parted the Red Sea, but remember, the Jordan River was parted by Joshua, okay? And, well, obviously, God was the one who did it, but, you know, at Joshua's request, he did it. And when he did that, in fact, have a look back at Joshua chapter number 4. Joshua chapter number 4, verse number, verse number 5. Joshua chapter 4, verse number 5. When that happened, it says, um, basically, he set up some stones as a memorial, memorial. Look at Joshua chapter 4, verse number 5. Joshua chapter 4, verse number 5. It says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when, notice this, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So the point of this pile of stones, 12 stones, say, that's what happened. This is, what, this is where it was. It was at this place. This is where God cut off the river. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And it goes through, and it goes through, it talks about how they all passed over. And then, um, oh, look down at, uh, where are we here, maybe? Verse number 19, it says, and the tenth day, <coughs> sorry, and the, and the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then sh ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry ground. 
For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. And so that's what it was for. It was, it was to be a, a sign, a memorial, to remind them. And of course, this is what we see back here in 1 Samuel chapter number 7. He takes a stone and sets it up, and he called it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And that's what Ebenezer's talking about, God helping us. Okay? In fact, I think there's even some hymns that talk about that. Now look down at verse number 13. Verse number 13. So the Philistines were subdued. The Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So notice here that the hand of God is against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And, and, and what that's kind of showing is that God is fighting against the Philistines during the time of Samuel. And it's showing that how one person can be significant. One person can, can have a great influence. God, speaking to Ezekiel, said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. And then sadly says, but I found none. God was looking for a man. He's looking for someone to stand in the gap, like Samuel was someone who stood in the gap. But sometimes he looks and he finds no one. That's a sad thing. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. Look, if you would, at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 6. Excuse me, Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 5. Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 5. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Notice what's he doing. He's confessing. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. He's confessing his, son, his own sin and his people's sin. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? He's seeking a man. Then said I, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And that reminds us, you know, God's looking for people. He's looking for people that he can send. We should have the attitude of Isaiah saying, I'm here, send me. Jesus said in John chapter number 20, verse 21, he said, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. In the same way that Jesus was sent, and what was Jesus sent for? To seek and to save that which was lost. Well, that's, that's the thing. That's the same with us. That's what we're sent for. One person can make a big difference. I mean, you might be that one person in your family who changes the direction your family is going in. Maybe, maybe you're the person who will bring salvation to your family. That you can say, look, this is what the Bible says. It's salvation by faith alone. Salvation by faith alone. I mean, there are so many people. I mean, I was just, just talking to that lady earlier on tonight. And she was trusting. She, in fact, I mean, it wasn't like it was faith and works. It was like, you know, works, repent, and, well, kind of, there might be a little bit of faith in there. It wasn't just like, you know, that's what it was all about. It was just about turning from your sin. You've got to turn from your sin. Now, and sometimes she was giving, I mean, it was, it was kind of hard to make out, because sometimes she gave me sort of a mixed message of, you know, salvation's one thing, and discipleship's another thing. And it's like, absolutely, you did right. But then she just kept taking these discipleship things and shoving them back into salvation. And that's why she said, you know, you could lose your salvation. I said, well, how would you lose it? Well, if you walked away, if you stopped doing what's right, so it's about what you do, is it? Is it about your works? You know? And so, but the thing is, you, just as one person, you can be an influence on your family. You can be a big influence on your family. I mean, think about the influence a mother can have on her children. Think about the influence that she can have. You know, Proverbs chapter 31 talks about the, you know, the, we call her the Proverbs 31 woman, but she's just got these great attributes. But think of the influence she has. Proverbs 31, 26 says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. You can tell, this is someone, this woman, she has a massive effect on her family, on her husband, on her children. One person can have a massive influence, and in, in not only her family, in a nation. In a nation, I mean, we were in Judges before. Look back at Judges chapter number 6. Look at Judges chapter number 6. And look at, and you could look at lots of different people in Judges, but look at, um, look at Gideon, for example. Look at Gideon. Um, Judges chapter number, uh, Judges chapter number 6. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, verse number 1, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. 
And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So they're, they're hiding. And it was so, and so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they come into Gaza and left no sub- sus- sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came up as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So it's the same thing. They've done evil, and then there's people coming in, and they're just you know, ruling over them. And then what are they doing? Then they, then they cry unto God. Um, look at... Um, you know, uh, look at verse number 11. Look at verse number 11. It says, um, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abbi Ezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. He's, 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 you know, he's hiding what he's doing. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So it's interesting here, the Lord appears to Gideon. Now, what's Gideon doing? He's, you know, he's... um. Uh, threshing wheat, but he's doing it behind the wine press so that no one sees him. Does he sound like a mighty man of valor? Does he sound like he's really brave and courageous? No, he's, he's hiding. He's staying out of trouble. But it's interesting that the angel the Lord called him a mighty man of valor, even though he wasn't yet. But of course, the thing is, although he wasn't yet a mighty man of valor, he could be. You know, it says in Romans four seventeen, it says, God calleth those things which be not as though they were. In other words, he's saying, this is what you can be. You might think, well, I'm not this now. I'm not a mighty man of valor. I'm not a mighty woman of valor. But you can be. You can be. And it's important that you have a vision of that. It says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. We need to have a vision for what people can be. And that's, that's the vision I have for you guys. I don't see you guys as, you guys are just sitting here and the way you are is the way you're always going to be. I don't see myself as the way I am is the way I'm always going to be. I see myself as being able to do more for God being able to serve God better. And I see the same for you guys. I see you guys giving the gospel to people, to your friends, to your family, to strangers. I see you going into all the world, to different countries, preaching the gospel to every creature. You know, you mean, I see you standing behind the pulpit preaching because that's what God wants. You know, we need, we need men to stand up. We need women to stand up, not in church, outside of church, the women can stand up. But that's what we need. We need people to do that. Okay? And so Gideon, he, he, didn't have that, he didn't have that great vision for what God could do through him. In fact, if you look down, at, um, look down at verse number 15, look at verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. So notice, he's saying, look, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, you know, I, my, he says, look, I can't save Israel. My family is poor. And I'm the least in my father's house. I'm a, he's saying, I'm a no one. I'm a nobody. I can't do anything. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He says, I'm going to be with you, and you're going to smite them as if, think of those you know, thousands, millions of Midianites, and you'll smite them as if it's only one person. Why? Because God is with you. And we won't go through it now for the sake of time, but if you look through, you know, read the rest of chapter number 6 and read chapter number 7 and see what happened. See what happened is basically God used Gideon and he took a few men with him. But even then, the number of the men that were with him, he reduced them to, so that they couldn't say, well, we did it in our own power. We did it in our own strength. He said, no, there's too many. In fact, yeah, look at the start of chapter number seven. It says, then Jerubal, who's called Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many. For me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me. Saying mine own hand has saved me. Saying you've actually got too many. There's too many people. I mean you imagine you're going into a battle. And you've got a great big army against you. And you've got you know not a very big army with you. And then God says you've got too many. You've got too many. And so what he says. He says look anyone who's fearful. Go back. So a whole pile of them leave, and then he goes through and does this test where, you know, go down and, and drink the water, and whoever, you know, laps it like a dog and all that sort of stuff, and he reduces it and reduces it and reduces it. And, and Gideon's he's got to be thinking, this is not good. But of course, the, it wasn't about them. It was about God. And when you see how they did it, you know, they, they just ended up just making a big shout. Basically, they, you know, got these lanterns, and they surrounded them. And there was only, it was only about 300, I think it was. Very few. 
and they surrounded, and then they, you know, so they had like candles burning under like pitches, and then they broke them, and so all of a sudden it's like lights appeared everywhere, and they all shouted, and the Midianites just basically, you know, started killing each other and running away and all that sort of stuff. Why? Because God was the one who was fighting for them, and that's what we saw back in um, First Samuel chapter number seven that God, He was the one who thundered upon them. Okay, and some people say, but you know, but. We need, to re- we, do- we need to understand that God uses the weak things. You might say, I'm, I can't do it because I'm weak. But God uses weak people. He uses weak people. Look, if you would keep your finger in 1 Samuel, but look at, um, look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And verse number, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 27. It says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Notice that, the weak things of the world, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And obviously, I mean, one of the greatest examples of that, of course, is salvation. For by grace you save through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God's not into people boasting. He's not into people boasting. And that's, that's the whole thing about work salvation. It's all about what we do. We do this, and I've got to turn for my sins. I've got to do this, that. That's boasting. But no, salvation, it's all of God. He's the one who gets the glory for it, not us. Okay? Um, but notice also that it's using the weak things. Now, some people say, you know, but doesn't it say in, in John 15, look, without me you can do nothing? True. The Bible does say, Jesus does say, without me you can do nothing. But it also says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So it's not that we, we can't do anything in and of ourselves, in our own strength. But in, with the strength of Jesus, we can do things. We can, you can do things that you don't think you can do. Because God can empower you. You know, the Bible says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Okay, back in 1 Samuel chapter number 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse number 14. And the cities of the Philistines, <clears throat> sorry, and the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even unto Gath, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. So the cities, they get restored to Israel. There's even peace between Israel and the Amorites. It says in Proverbs 16, 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And that's what we see happening here. Verse number 15. And Samuel judged Israel... All the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpe and judged Israel in all those places. So Samuel here, he judged Israel all the days of his life. And that kind of, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'll serve God, you know, for a while. You often see pastors be like this, you know, I'll serve God for a while and then it's time to retire and then I'll go and, you know, go and live in some sunny place and just sort of relax for the rest of my days. Well, we don't see Samuel doing that. All the days of his life. All the days we, we, we don't we don't have to ever retire from serving God. We should always be serving God, because the thing is, when we stop serving, when we get out of the fight, then what's going to happen? We'll go off into sin, you know. I mean, the, the Bible says, well, actually, the Bible doesn't say, but surely everyone, everyone knows the devil makes work for idle hands. The devil makes work for idle hands, and that, that, that's very true. It's a very true thing. Okay, and so and that's true. Now, as you get older, you might we might alter the way we serve God a bit. You know, um, we might not be able to do some of the same things that we used to do in the same way or the same amount. But still, what do what you can yeah. with what you got, as long as long as we've got breath. You know, and that's what we see in the Bible. That's you know, people served God until you know. And John, he was old, and he kept serving God. Okay, um, we're always. In, still enrolled in God's army. Verse number 17. It says, And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So Samuel, he kept returning to his home in Ramah. So although he, he did travel around all Israel judging the people, but he kept returning back to his home. Kind of a, just a wee side note here. It's important not to neglect your family when you're serving God. I'm talking about serving God your whole, whole life. But it's important not to neglect your family. In fact, we'll actually see next week that Samuel could well have been guilty of that, of neglecting his family and what he did. And that's, that's, that's kind of like one of, one of the reasons why one of the qualifications of 
being a, like a, an elder or a bishop or a pastor is to rule your own house, house rule your own house well. It's, a, it's an important thing, okay? That we shouldn't neglect our family, think, well, I'm going to serve God, but one of the jobs God's given you is to raise your family. If you're a man, it's to lead your family. If, if you're a woman, it's to raise your children. You know, it's to, it's, to, it's to teach them, it's to train them. God's given you that responsibility. Don't think, well, I'm going to leave the responsibility God's given me, and I'm going to go off and serve God over here. Well, the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. Rather than sacrificing your family, you know, how about obeying God and doing what God tells you to do with your family? You know, and um, yeah, it's an important principle. So just wrapping up, what we've basically seen in this chapter, we've seen that when God's people turn to him, when they obey his word, when they seek his help, remember they, they confess their sins, they call upon him, God brings deliverance. He brings deliverance. And it's not talking about, actually someone else I met at, so it's not talking about some sort of strange deliverance ministry. Okay? It's what it's about. It's about obeying the voice of the Lord. Obeying the voice of the Lord. Um, turn, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter number 7. Second Chronicles chapter number 7. This is a great verse that sums it up really well. Second Chronicles chapter number 7. And verse number 14, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, says, If my people, page 488, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. What's one of the reasons why people don't pray? Don't humble themselves. It says, humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. And then it says, and turn from their wicked ways. So notice that. Humble, pray, seek God's face, but then it says turn from their wicked ways. That means stop disobeying. Put away the Baal and Ashtoreth. Put away these things you shouldn't be involved in. Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And we saw obviously the examples of them being rescued from the people that were, that were oppressing them. You know, whether it's the Philistines or the Midianites or, or whoever it may be. We also saw back in 1 Samuel 7, we saw, remember we saw the difference between the people of Kirjith Jerem compared to the people of Beth Shemesh, you know, um, that because they were doing, you know, remember Eliezer, he, he, sanctified, he was sanctified to look after it compared to people that just went and looked in there and were struck dead. Um, we also saw the, the difference that one person can make. Remember Samuel, his was the one prayer that was answered. Okay? Um, we same thing with, John, or with, um, with Daniel, excuse me. He was the one. That one person, I mean, did Daniel, did he make a difference in the kingdom? Absolutely, he did. He made, made a massive difference. He was one that, you know, remember when the lion's den, he was the one, you know, and obviously he had his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't bow down to the, to the statue, but they made a, a huge difference. One person can make a difference. But of course, part of it is, it starts with that confession. We're to confess our sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then it also says, in Proverbs chapter 28, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. So if you hide your sins, are you going to do well? No, you won't prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So confess them to God, but also forsake them. That means stop doing the things that are wrong. Stop doing those wrong things. Now we understand, it's not for salvation. It's not like that, that woman I was talking to. Yeah, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved. No, not to be saved. Salvation is by grace you save through faith. Not yourselves, it's a gift of God. You know? It's just simply believing. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's all it is. But having said that, if you want to live a successful life, if you want to live a blessed, happy life, if you want to live a, go a, 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 a godly life, then we do need to forsake our sins. Definitely. And, um, and that's the example in the book of Judges, over and over. They did evil, but then when they went back to God, then he delivered them. And God will deliver you, but you need to turn to him. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and thank you for the, uh, for the example. The, once again, the good examples and the bad examples. Lord, please help us to be a faithful people, Lord. Help us to put away the things in our life. I don't know what it is for each different person. It could be, could be all sorts of things. It could be maybe it's the maybe it's the television that's got them captive. Maybe it's maybe it's the internet. Maybe it's any number of sins that people can be involved with that captures their mind, that captures their heart. Lord, please help us 
to turn from these things, to put away these things, put away these, these false gods, these things that would set themselves up above you. Help us to put you first and foremost in our life, to seek you first, to seek the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And Lord, we ask you to forgive our sins and that you'd cleanse us and that you'd use us in your service. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.